testosterone time. You're going to love today's episode. This has taken us a long time to do. You know, we've uh, flirted with a lot of TRT and hormone replacement clinics in the past, talked to them. We're never really satisfied until we found Dr. Rand McLean. That's who we interview in this episode. By the way, we put something together with them for Mind Pump listeners. So if you're interested in TRT or hormone replacement or want to see if you're a candidate, head over to mphormones.com. I know you're going to love this episode. By the way, we're also going to give away free access to Maps Powerlift to one of you lucky viewers. You're so lucky. Here's how you can potentially win access, free access to Maps Powerlift. Leave a comment below on the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. If we like your comment, if we pick your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to Maps Powerlift. Also, one more thing, 72 hours left for our huge July promotion. Maps Hit and the No BS Six Pack Formula, both 50% off. Again, there's only 72 hours left for that sale. Head over to Maps fitnessproducts.com. Just don't forget to use the code July special with no space for that discount. All right. Enjoy the show. Dr. Rand, I'm super excited to have you in studio today. Uh, give the audience, I'm going to give the audience a little bit of backstory on how I came across you. And it was Sal actually introduced me to you. I was already doing hormone therapy through another company and I'd had a few months in and I was expressing to Sal like after I'm like, you know, I'm not I'm not really impressed with these doctors. I'm like, I know that I don't have a lot of uh, knowledge in hormone therapy, but I have enough to understand some things. And I'd be asking all these questions of the nurses that were talking to me. And just, they seemed like they didn't have any of the right answers for me. And so I was like, you know what? Let me do some research. Let me find out who's in the space, who's doing the best job at this. And he began communicating with you and he says, yeah, I know you're set up with this other company, but I want you to, to meet Dr. Ran and have a discussion with him. And it was such a great conversation. The very first time that I talked to you, I mean, you, you blew my mind as far as your extensive knowledge uh, on hormone therapy. And I kind of want to start there for the audience so they can get a little bit of background. Where does all this knowledge come from? Uh, when, when did you start doing this? And when did you learn all about hormone replacement therapy? Well, it's a good question, and, and it kind of begs the question, how do you know I have all this extensive knowledge because there's so much <laughs> ignorance out there, right? You yeah. know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of still questions that have to be answered because it's not really become as mainstream as it should be. Uh, a lot of urologists now are taking over, thanks to Dr. Lipschultz and a lot of his fellows, and I think urology will be the, the torchbearer, uh, you know, henceforward for testosterone replacement, uh, and it makes sense, right? Uh, but I think we're probably 10 years off from that being in the mainstream because there aren't a whole lot of Lipschultzes out there. And, and while his fellows are spreading around the United States, I still think, um, you know, we'll be in business at least for another 10 years because it's just not everywhere. And, and boy, when you talk about the ladies, uh, OBGYNs, I don't think have pick, picked up the slack. Um, you know, so, so we'll, we'll be in business with them, you know, for, for even longer, I'm sure. But um, where it got started was really, I mean, in sport, uh, I've always been fascinated by trying to be able to do better at sport and uh, and, and repair my body. Um, I was kind of a sickly kid. You know, they took out my tonsils when I was pretty young because that was the thing back then. If you're sick all the time, yeah. well, must be those tonsils. Mm -hmm. So they yanked those yep. early. You too, right? Yep. <laughs> and, um, you know, I got interested in nutrition because I was fascinated by the fact that you could control a lot of how you feel and how you perform with the use of nutrition. Um and then, you know, you started reading about uh, anabolic steroids, not so much testosterone back then. The, the, the hullabaloo was about uh, anabolic steroids. In the 80s, I think Sports Illustrated came out with an article that 85% of the NFL players were on anabolic steroids. So, of course, you go, okay, yeah, I want to be bigger, stronger, faster. I had Olympic aspirations. And so I was just telling you before, you know, I can remember in high school uh, wrestling one season and being able to dishrag one of my, my, my teammates and then after summer, he came back 30 pounds heavier and was tossing me around the mat like I was a dish rag myself. So, you know, they're telling us that it didn't work was falling on deaf ears because clearly it worked. And, um, you know, that sparked my interest. Now, smash cut to many years down the road, I got into medicine myself. And uh, it was easy to start practicing because one of the physicians I started with was already doing it. And um, with all due respect to, to him, 
I didn't think it was the best way of doing it. And I guess I skipped a long, long period of, of life where I was experimenting with these things myself, whether it be testosterone, but mainly, um, uh, you know, anabolics back in the day. And of course we were doing it different too, not to start rambling on to another question here, but you know, back in the day, stacks weren't the big deal. Uh, we, we couldn't afford them. They weren't available. So, you know, we got to know, for example, decadiroblin by itself and what it would do. And just like, you know, maybe some of you guys could do, uh, you could tell a Cuban cigar from a, a, a Dominican Republic uh, cigar because, you know, it had a different flavor because we were using them separately we knew, okay, well, this is definitely real DECA because of mm. the side effects or the things that came with it, or this is real Dianabol, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, a lot of the knowledge, uh, to answer your question, was picked up along the way from from use. And, you know, look, the gym and bro science has its, its negative aspects, no doubt about it. But it's also a great Petri dish for what works. Now, the explanations for why it works are often just, you go, okay, <laughs> You skip physiology class, I can tell, and some biology and other classes too. But again, it's one of the uh, the most stringent uh, regulators of some of these things because it either works or it doesn't. You either pick up the weight or you don't, uh, and uh, or you lift it over your head, a heavy weight or not is what I mean to say. So the proof is in the pudding, and, and they're some of the harshest critics in the gym. So, you know, uh, I learned a lot in the gym from fellow athletes is what I'm getting at. And, uh, and then again, for my own use, what was your, so as your journey into educating yourself about this, what were some of the first big misconceptions that you learned? Well, like I said earlier, that it doesn't work, that, uh, you know, you become impotent and your willy's going to fall off one day and all that kind of stuff. I mean, just some of the stupidest stuff you'd ever heard. And then it's going to, you know, you're, you're never going to come back once you use anabolic steroids, your own endogenous production will never return. These are the things that are still perpetuated. I mean, you wouldn't believe some of the things you can still hear from, and I don't mean to be picking on anybody, but at the same time, I don't want to let anybody off. There's, there are no excuses anymore. Uh, there, there's plenty of information published out there, even though it's not taught in medical school, as far as I know, to this day. It wasn't when I was in, in school. Uh, but, um, you know, doctors will, will, will still say that, for example, testosterone, just using testosterone in a replacement fashion, will raise your hemoglobin hematocrit, okay, and your red blood cell count. That's not true. If you've got someone who might be, in a, I call them an expensive date, who has to use more than the typical amount of testosterone because they, they break down the ester, for example, and they metabolize it quickly, and we're, we're, we're using more than a typical uh, replacement dose, well, then you might spike your, your hemoglobin hematocrit by maybe, you know, a, a half a point. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, Nothing, that's not a big deal. Well, this is yeah. what you actually you. This is what you said to me. I'll never forget when we had that first conversation, and you and you and you made that uh, analogy to me. And I thought that was really funny because I thought the opposite was going to be true with uh, my situation. I thought that I would need more testosterone because I abused it so much in my twenties, and that's why I'd be an expensive day. And you broke it down differently to me. So explain what makes somebody a, a quote unquote expensive date. Just the way you choose your parents. I mean, it's really just luck of the draw. I've, I've had guys that are, you know, we call them steroidians for 30 years that come in for replacement therapy and could really, if they wanted to, probably get away with injecting, you know, 200 milligrams per ml of testosterone cypionate, which is a typical starting dose, every nine or 10 days because they metabolize it very, very slowly. So it's not necessarily what you did before. Now, your liver can accommodate in certain ways and make more or less aromatase. That's more of a, of a factor based upon, you know, prior use. But even then prior use, we're talking about, you know, months ago, not years ago, uh, because your liver will, will adjust to some of the, for example, foods you eat and some of your lifestyle factors to either produce more or less aromatase. But yeah, what, what you did before uh, is, is not a, a really a, a, as much a factor, certainly as, as people think. And, um, uh, just, just to follow up on the, the testosterone thing, cause I think it's important for, for people to know, uh, you know, elevating your hemoglobin and hematocrit. What typically is the case is, um, more times than not it's sleep apnea. In other words, the testosterone could leverage hemoglobin and hematocrit production, right? Red blood cell count. Uh, you need it. People who come in with really low testosterone will often have low, uh, hemoglobin and, and hematocrit and can be, uh, even anemic because of it, which just means you're below normal uh, hemoglobin. Uh, but it's not 
uh, testosterone in and of itself doesn't cause a problem unless you're going to really high dosages. It leverages it though. Mm. So we see sleep apnea a lot, especially in, in, I mean, everyone in here has probably got a mild form of sleep apnea. I'm looking at everyone's neck, oh, right? We got it muscly guys oh, no. in here. And typically a good ear, nose and throat doctor will look at you and go, oh, your neck is at least 17 inches. You probably have some obstruction there. Mm. And, oh, and as you age, you know, things get a little, um, I don't want to say softer necessarily, but uh, maybe looser. If you have a, 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 you know, a drink or two before you go to bed or anything that might relax you, those muscles will relax more and, and collapse on the trachea. So, uh, you know, you'll, you'll find this. And of course, testosterone will leverage that. That's why guys, even in the Tour de France, not anymore, of course, <laughs> uh, but, no. but uh, they might use testosterone not because they certainly don't want to get any bigger. They want to be 6'2", 135 to be able to get up the hill, but they know it leverages the production of testosterone, hmm. which is the, sorry, leverages the production of testosterone. Beg your pardon. Here. Using testosterone leverages the production of red blood cells and hemoglobin, the oxygen carrying capacity of the red blood cell. So Dr. Ryan, because you've been doing this for a little while, I wanted to ask you, because the attitudes towards testosterone uh, really change severely and they seem to be, the pendulum seems to be swinging back in the other direction. Because I know in the early days, uh, testosterone, even anabolics, they were very easy to come by when I read stories about, you know, the 1960s and 70s. Then steroids became kind of public enemy number one, which right. included testosterone. It was a scheduled drug. Although I would love for you to correct me if I'm wrong, but of all the hormones you could potentially inject into your body, testosterone has to be one of the safer ones, uh, especially if you compare it to like insulin and other hormones. But absolutely. So, and in some countries it's over the counter, um, but nonetheless, it became public enemy number one and doctors were afraid or couldn't prescribe. So if you were a guy and you go to your doctor in the 1980s or 90s, they test your testosterone. It's in the floor. You're not doing very good. They're super reluctant to even prescribe it. Now we see TRT facilities are popping up everywhere. What changed in that? Like what happened to where the where it was like you could not get any hormone replacement and now it seems to be much more available? I got a few answers because you got a few questions in there. I okay. hope we can keep track of this and come back when yeah, I no get problem. lost on a tangent here. But <laughs> I mean, starting with you know, they, it would, the any of these substances were banned as of the 76 Olympics. Okay, that's where things definitely changed was that when the east germans showed up and just crushed everybody because they well okay you, you know you can blame it on them but you know <laughs> al order was given special dispensation for his i think it was his last olympics because he had been on anabolics for so long and it was legal to compete on anabolic steroids again prior to 76 that uh you know the assumption was okay you you know you use them now you're dependent upon them so it's my understanding he got special dispensation for his last olympics that might be a, a fairy tale i don't know but again the point is it wasn't a problem until that point. And then, yeah, everything changed. Now, why it became public enemy, enemy number one, and it wasn't number one, but it was up there at the top of the list, right? I couldn't tell you. I have no idea. Why has, uh, and I don't mean to, I'm just picking one, and I don't have a special thing in my heart about marijuana, but, you know, we saw movies from, I guess, what, the 50s and 60s, uh, yeah. you know, Reefer Madness, and I've never seen the movie. I've just heard about it where, you know, you smoke pot, it's going to lead to heroin addiction, and you're going to jump off a building one day and, and kill yourself. Mm -hmm. So, why, you know, and we know better. Well, who dreams this stuff up? With yeah. testosterone, like you say, it's probably one of the safest hormones out there. It's definitely, you mentioned insulin. Insulin can kill you, mm. no doubt. I've never seen a case where testosterone killed anybody. Estrogen, okay, can kill you. Okay, certain forms of estrogen are, are associated with prostate cancer and, uh, and all kinds of estrogen-sensitive cancers in, in females. So, yeah, why it became such a... Uh, why was, it developed such a stigma? Lyle I couldn't tell. Alzado, was he a big part of that? With, oh, I remember uh, that. Yeah, they like uh, you know pointed him as like that was a big problem with um, you know his health was that he was a big steroid user. Yeah, I got to be careful here because of legal reasons, but I would argue that um, that was not the cause of death for mm -hmm. Lyle Alzado, and and I probably should leave it at that. But uh, there are certain stigmas with certain diseases that I think, you know, he may or may want to, may or may not have, and I'm speculating here, let's make it clear so mm -hmm. none of us get in trouble. But uh, Lai was a great guy. I knew him from Golds and he was a super loving guy. But uh, if you look into some of the things that were associated with his death, it might have been something else that caused him. I know of nothing that uh, testosterone would have contributed to, to the things he died of. You know, what, what would that be? Brain cancer, I've never heard of a, a testosterone stimulating brain cancer uh, or perpetuating it. I mean, it's just, like you said, it's a very safe hormone. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. So um, don't don't know about that. But then, okay, I, there was like three parts to your yeah. Life. So so it was it was so because it became like this enemy drug, and it was thrown in the category of steroids or testosterone being technically a steroid as well. It was impossible for men to get treated for low testosterone, or even it wasn't even people weren't even aware that there could be an issue. Now it seems like the pendulum has kind of swung where. In, in, in where it's, it's people are more aware, there's more facilities available. Is this because of the that there's so many men now with testosterone issues, or have they changed the laws, or what has caused this pendulum start to kind of swing the other way? Well, I think public demand. I mean, I, I can tell you that, for example, I had uh, a, a young lady in my office who brought her mom in for whatever reason. They only had one car, and she was along for the ride. And she was probably mom was in her 70s, and this gal was probably in her early 40s. And she had low testosterone, was complaining of all kinds of symptoms of low testosterone. And just out of politeness, I looked at mom and asked her how she was doing. And she said, I'm fine. And I said, you know, nothing like your daughter here, none of these symptoms. She says, no. Then 90 days later, uh, daughter comes back with mom again for the follow-up. And um, I, being polite again, asked mom how she was doing. And mom wasn't doing so well. All of a sudden, she had all the symptoms that her daughter had complained of earlier. Um my point being that, you know, the humans are pretty phenomenal creatures in a, in a lot of ways. If there's nothing you can do about it, if you've got an ounce of character, what do you do? You deal with you, it. You muscle mm-hmm. up and deal with yeah. it, right? So mom had been doing that because her generation, is, in my opinion, did not have these options, right? Like you said earlier, it wasn't really available. Certainly not to women is an even more example, a better example. And now she sees her daughter getting better and all of a sudden, well, yeah, I'd like to get better too. It's probably going mm-hmm. on at least subconsciously. And, and, and this is typical. And I think with guys, now that we know, hey, it's not this public enemy, testosterone replacement, and my buddy down the street is using it, or my buddy in the gym is using it and doing so much better now, I can see it. That's how I found out about it. I asked him, I said, dude, what are you doing, right? And he, and he found out about it. So public demand is leading that charge, certainly, okay? Also, doctors. I mean, I got a lot of patients that are doctors, they're finding out about it and they're going, wait, well, this is a great way to help my patients. Uh, this is a great way to make a living. And come on, I have a great job. I, I don't have people complaining about major problems. They're not on 26 medications typically. They're people that are trying to get even better in terms of health and, and optimizing it. So what a great way to make a living. So more doctors are incorporating it into their practice. It's now being covered uh, oftentimes by insurance. Even the, the HMOs of the world are, are sometimes covering it. The problem there is, to get to another uh, problem, is before you have doctors looking at reference intervals. And those reference intervals for testosterone are very broad. Yeah, so explain that, that reference, because I know I look at the numbers, I'm like, it goes it's like between 300 and 1,200. It's like, that's a big difference. <laughs> well, that was another thing that you mm-hmm. blew my mind and corrected me on, too, was uh, the other place, we, we always talked about this generic range, right? They would tell me like, oh, 400, I think, to 1,200 of free testosterone is this kind of optimal, total. Uh, you know, or total testosterone yeah. is this optimal place to be. And uh, I remember you telling me that, yeah, but there's other things, other factors I'm looking at on your blood work that are actually more important. Go into that a little bit. You remember that conversation? Yeah. No, because I have it frequently, uh, <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately. First of all, I don't know where they're getting those reference intervals f- from. And, and I see it all across assays. You know, nowadays, for example, you can see a cholesterol uh, reference interval that is nothing close to whatever they want to call it, normal, because I see these assays day in and day out and zero to 99 uh i'm going to forget the units of measurement right now in terms of say ldl cholesterol is not normal okay so where they're getting those reference intervals i couldn't tell you uh, unless you're on a statin or getting chased by lions on the serengeti plane on a daily basis you're not seeing somebody below 99 typically uh, when it comes to testosterone again i have no idea where they're getting those numbers from they have adjusted them by the way some some companies from that, uh, it was like 1197 LabCorp used to have at the top of the range. That's unusual. Mm. Uh, now they've 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 clipped it back to somewhere um, in the 900s, I believe. Okay. But but the point is, it's your point. Uh, I, I think this is the question you're asking. First of all, even if that were normal, so what? As I like to to, to joke with, but make a point with my patients, it's normal to get sick and die one day. Who cares about what's normal? One day, zero is going to be normal for you because you're going to be six feet under. Nothing's working, right? Yeah. What we want to concentrate on, I would think, in medicine is what's optimal. 
What's the best thing for you? So if you see someone, and, and this is typical, my typical patient, especially coming from an HMO or a doctor that hasn't been educated in this yet, they look at your labs and they go, okay, for example, in your case, uh, you're saying that the, the reference interval you saw was 400 and above was normal. Okay, you're at 450. Big whoop, yeah. right? At the end of the day, what do you treat? The numbers or the patient? Right. If you're still having issues, complaints, then the numbers are to be used as guidance. If you had 1,100 total testosterone, and more importantly, by the way, your free testosterone was commensurate at, say, 22 picograms per milliliter, then you go, you know, probably not testosterone that's causing you the problem. Makes sense, right? Because that's, that's pretty flush. That's a nice nice level of testosterone. You might look at other reasons for a lack of energy, a lack of libido, uh, et cetera, uh, or a lack of body competition, uh, composition, you know, quit eating the cheeseburgers all the time with the, <laughs> with the milkshake and supersize and all that stuff. You get my point. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, that that's probably the other problem that has started to change is that doctors are realizing, oh, you know, I, the, the reference intervals are just that. They're there for reference and, and support or, or, or subtraction from a diagnosis rather than a rigid level. And one of the, the guys that helped that immensely was a guy named Abraham Morgenthaler, who uh, wrote a book, uh, Testosterone for Life, I, I believe was the name of the book. And earlier in his career, he had set a limit. I think it was 450, as a matter of fact, for, for total T. Didn't even concern himself with free T. Um, and then, uh, finally in an international consensus, I think from 2016, uh, said, Hey, it's not about the number. It's about, uh, the, the patient, which is kind of a duh, right? You would mm -hmm. think. And anyway, things have changed uh, because that's now published and, and he's a big shot in, in the industry. He's got a much better resume than I do. You know, I think he's an associate professor with Harvard and, and so that that's helped things a lot too. Yeah. I think. Yeah, I remember reading years ago because you know obviously I've been in the fitness space now for for decades, and what we used to hear all the time were the dangers of high amounts of anabolics or high amounts of testosterone. And what, you know, this is of course this was popular media. How bad it is for your heart, how bad it is for your health, and and then I remember reading actual scientific articles. This was a little later in my career, and seeing, and I had no idea. I had no idea that low testosterone. <laughs> had s severe health longevity mm -hmm. effects. Would you, can you go into that? It's like, because I think a lot of us think high testosterone is really bad, but on the other end of the spectrum, and maybe we can get into that, like high testosterone, is that really bad? But let's talk about the low testosterone and what that could, besides feeling like crap, besides having low energy, low confidence, low libido, what are the health risks of having uh, just low testosterone? Let's definitely come back to the risks of high levels, okay? Yeah. But, um, because first of all, the definition of high is, is, should be defined okay, or undefined, at least in terms of the reference intervals that we have currently. And there's other factors that come with high levels of testosterone use in the bodybuilding community. But to answer your question, absolutely. We have studies that go back, I think as far as the 1950s, showing a, a correlation between low testosterone and things like coronary artery disease type two diabetes, colon cancer, prostate cancer, osteoporosis, okay? And that's other than prostate cancer in both men and women. Dementia right? and Alzheimer's too, I just read recently. Which, which, which adds up, right? I mean, you can start drawing all kinds of, and again, I, I use the word carefully, correlations, because look, if you had low testosterone, for example, given all the other things you do for your fitness and your, your health, more than likely, more than likely, you're not going to have an issue with type two diabetes, for example, or coronary artery disease. Okay. okay? Although there are other factors uh, that, that play in and, and that's the thing it's multifactorial. So we're always generalizing, which okay. is important to, uh, you know, to, to include in the discussion and any discussion that's medical, everything should be individualized, but, um, I'm going off on too many tangents. I apologize. No problem. Um, we know generally speaking though, that there is a correlation. And when we correct these things, life gets better and the likelihood of some of these disease states decreases. That's a given. Okay. So yeah, um, there, there have been some studies, so-called studies that have raised the attention. And if you remember maybe, um, six, seven years ago, I'm terrible with time, but on ESPN, every 15 minutes, there was an advertisement for a class action lawsuit. If you or your loved ones have been involved 
uh, or been prescribed testosterone. Do you remember those? No, I don't remember that <clears throat> one, but I know the commercials. I do because he didn't watch ESPN. <laughs> <laughs> what well, was based on, uh, I believe, two studies, one of which I remember, you know, it was a VA study, which well, I'll, I'll just stop there, right? Uh, but no, going further, uh, they used a cream. The... Uh, and, and by the way, the, 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 the upshot of this study was it increased the risk of heart issues, mainly coronary artery disease. Um, but uh, so, so one of the knocks, and I'm not suggesting that this is true necessarily, but one of the knocks on the VA system is there's very little follow through. And they, they uh, uh, in, in some instances, I mean, there's some great uh, counterexamples to this, but in a lot of areas of the country, the, the, the care is not that great. So anyway, you have a guy who jumps into this study and they give him a cream. There's no way to determine if the patient was compliant. So he might've said, okay, yeah, I'll do this and got his other meds that same day. Um, but got maybe to the front of the line because he participated in the study. I don't know. Mm. I don't want to speculate any further than I am already. But then three months later comes back, applies the cream that day. Cause he knows he's getting tested again, no assurance of compliance. But the treatment was ridiculous based upon what we know, what we know now. It was like, you know, some of these, um, and I won't name names, but some of these branded uh, gels and creams that, you know, don't even have enough in them. The dosing is not even sufficient for a female in most cases. So they weren't being treated, really. Uh, we can't be sure that even in, with the treatment they were given, they were, they were compliant. And here's the kicker. These guys in this study were all in line for cardiac catheterization, meaning they were already oh, heart geez. patients. Oh. And yet it was published, okay, in peer-reviewed journals. Hmm. Uh, a bunch of us got together, and of course, once we saw this, and it takes, you know, months, if not years, to reverse some of the stuff, objected, the study was retracted. You know, the, the journal was, was spanked for even publishing it. And, um, you know, there you have it. There you had people that were... And, and, you know, this is, I, I, I called one of my best buddies in the whole world who happens to be a PI attorney. I said, and it happens to be on, I'm not going to name his name because he happens to be on therapy. <coughs> Excuse me. And I said, friend, what's going on here? And I went on off, I started off on a rant. He says, whoa, 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 rant. He says, it has nothing to do with the medicine. It's a class action lawsuit. That's the brass ring for an attorney. Okay. They got a lot to win and very little to lose. So that's how these things get perpetuated. And, you know, patients of mine, either that were already on therapy or that were thinking about it or coming in and going, w w w what's going on here? I heard it can ha cause heart problems. And, and you got to back through, you know, over 70 years worth of research and undo, you know, undo all that because of one lousy, you know, irresponsibly published study. Hmm. It, it's, it's remarkable. And I say 70 years because we've known since the 1950s that this stuff is it not only works, but it's very, very safe. We've got plenty of studies that go back that far. Wow. No, so now let's go back to the high testosterone fears uh, that were it's dangerous to have too much or, you know, taking too much can cause problems. Let's talk about that. Maybe, I guess, paint the context. What, what would you consider too much? Would it be out of range or does it depend on the individual? There have been no studies that I'm aware of that use dosages that we might find in your typical uh, bodybuilder uh, program in a, you know, prescribed, if you will, in a gym, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of hard to answer on one hand, but having seen all this, you know, go on in a gym, uh, a couple things come to mind. First of all, there's, you know, in terms of a, we don't have a formal study, but even in terms of analyzing this, we don't know what those guys are getting necessarily. This is all bootleg uh, pharm pharmaceutical stuff, right? And, and based on what I've seen, a lot of this stuff is stepped on because guys will come to me and say, doc, you know, uh, you, you know, what 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 comes here stays here, right? You know they're afraid that I'm going to report them or something like that. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they'll tell me what they're doing. I get this impossible, especially based upon your laboratory assays. So there's definitely evidence that whatever they're getting in the gym is not necessarily what it's supposed to be. Interesting. Uh, so you'll hear about guys doing you know three grams of something a week. <laughs> That's impossible. You know, it's just it's just not going to happen. But even if they were, you know, back in the day, you hear stories of guys doing, uh, and you know, how do you sub substantiate these stories? Guys doing a gram or two of something a week. Okay, even if you were, uh, you know, I, I, the the risks of excess testosterone or certain anabolics would be uh, conversion to other substances like excess estrogen or dihydrotestosterone. And uh, as you know, certain anabolics will not convert. 
um, to to DHT uh, or estrogen. So so even those are limited. The other risks that most doctors will talk about, and this opens up a whole other can of worms, is every, and it's rare you can say this in medicine, every anabolic steroid comes with side effects to raise so-called bad cholesterol, LDL, and I say so-called for a reason, and lower uh, uh, so-called good cholesterol. And so that's a major reason why uh, in, in practice, if some doctor were to prescribe an anabolic steroid, they will typically always weigh risks versus benefits, but uh, pull you off after say three months and watch for your lipid profile mm. to re-equilibrate. Why I couldn't tell you, unless you have established coronary artery disease, it makes no difference. And this goes off into another conversation about lipids and, and how we look at things for the last, again, 70 years incorrectly when we when we evaluate someone's lipid profile. If you wouldn't mind, let's go, let's get into that because you're saying so-called bad, so-called good. Why, why are you referring to them that way? Well, there's a lot of issues with the standard lipid panel. We're looking at LDL cholesterol and it goes well beyond that. Um, but first and foremost, again, and, and it's a great timing because the people on the, what people call a dirty ketogenic diet, where they're using a lot of uh, saturated fats for their ketogenic uh, diet, you see a lot of elevated LDLs. Well, and if that were killing people, you know, we see people dropping dead left and right. Cause I see people in my office on these diets that have an LDL over 200, right? LDL doesn't cause the problem. Okay. LDL comes in after the problem has started and the problem starts with, with, inflammation. And I use the analogy uh, of gasoline in your garage, probably, if you still have um, an electric lawnmower. Not, sorry, if you don't have an electric, you still have a gas-powered lawnmower. By five gallons of gas, it's pretty useful. Okay, cholesterol is useful. After all, it's how we make cholesterol. Sorry, it's how we make cholesterol-based hormones. Right. Okay. Um, and so they are very important until you go on TRT, then it doesn't matter so much, right? Um, but that five gallon gasoline can is not going to be a problem to you as long as you're not using your acetylene torch next to it, right? Now, if you are, then you might have a serious problem as well as maybe your neighbor. If you don't have inflammation, if you don't have a, 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 an irritation inside the endothelial wall of your coronary arteries, then all the, 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 the so-called bad cholesterol in the world is not going to start a problem. It will finish it for you. It'll start you off. It will, it will not start you off. It'll finish off what you started with inflammation, okay? Um, and, and then to go into the measurements. Do we really want to look at LDL or do we want to look at LDLP? Or do we want to look at LP little a? These are other measurements that get into more of the brass tacks of your lipids that, that actually make a difference that are more correlated. Mm, so like these are the, are you talking about like the smaller or larger particle LDL particles? Is that what that refers to? More the number with L LDLP, okay. <clears throat> the number of particles, and then LP little a is, is another measurement altogether. And, they, and even those two are correlated somewhat. So you don't have to necessarily get both of them. You're, you're in pretty good stead. I'm just being practical now as a physician getting one or the other, but just getting a standard LDL is, is standard of care. And so legally, you know, a lot of physicians are, are really, including me, are sort of forced to grab that. And okay, if I saw a, um, you know, I saw a guy the other day with 316 LDL, I go, okay, well, you know, you're at greater risk uh, than someone else if you have established coronary artery disease. So it might leverage me to go into recommending, say, you know, the starting course would be a bilateral carotid Doppler ultrasound where they just look at your carotid arteries to see if you do have any evidence of coronary artery disease in which the LDL would, again, make a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, but if not, you know, you move on. There's a 95% correlation, again, between what we see here and what's in the heart. And this isn't me making this up. If you talk to the top cardiologists, say the top 5% of the cardiologists, they'll agree. You know, this is Stefan Room over at UCLA, best in the West, uh, has been doing this for 20, 25 years. And, and guys like Mark Penn, you know, formerly of Cleveland Clinic will agree. Because it's it's uh, it's not a factor this this cholesterol unless you have coronary artery disease to begin with. So so it's a good. What, what's your biggest risk for for coronary artery disease? Like most diseases, age, mm -hmm. right? So if you're 30 and you have an LDL of 200, am I really going to start worrying about it unless you have you know a first degree relative, another risk in your family that had coronary artery disease early in life? So you see, there's there's a lot of factors here, and and again, the problem is what we're talking about here is trying to do kind of paint by numbers medicine. We all do it. We generalize. That's how we, we move in the right direction with medicine. But 
you, know, you still have to treat everybody individually. You, you, you brought up inflammation. Is testosterone anti-inflammatory? Because I've, I've known people who, when their testosterone is low, they feel lots of aches and pains. They feel stiff. Then they get on TRT and all of a sudden they feel loose and not as much pain. Is that due to any <clears throat> anti-inflammatory effects? I wouldn't say in a direct way. I would say in an indirect way because you're healthier. And of course, okay. even just, for example, stability at a joint that might be already arthritic. If you've got some more strength, you know, put on a little muscle and, and because of testosterone use and combined with you know, proper exercise, yes. you strengthen the area, then you're less likely to have um, a, 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 when you don't want it to mobilize in the wrong directions, you know, a mobilized joint, it stays more stable and you have less pain. Definitely. I mean, I, so I, I hear reduced that all inflammation time. for more strength, which we see as trainers all the time, making someone mm -hmm. stronger, less pain because they're moving better. Therefore, you know, and less inflammation. You now, now the, 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 as, as with so many things, the 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 poisons in the dose, um, and arguably, certainly when you move into anabolic steroids, part of the stimulation, sort of like the 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 sand in the oyster to stimulate muscle growth is, is a little more inflammation. So you, know, uh, you gotta be careful to say, is it anti-inflammatory or not? I wouldn't say it's one way or the other, but with the example I gave you, I sort of skirted the, the, the answer to the question. Certainly if you had a, an arthritic uh, knee, for example, strengthening the knee in most cases, or, or even if it weren't arthritic, if it was a, you know, a loose ACL or something like that, uh, would, would make for less pain. What are, what are some of the biggest mistakes that they that doctors make with TRT with their patients that you see? Let me let me jump in here real quick and hopefully you can edit all this stuff and yeah. make it more more flowing. But I wanted to think of I, I wanted to touch on one thing about the excess testosterone. Okay. One of the things that comes with that, uh, I, I harped on one about okay, you're not really getting three grams equivalent. It's probably mm -hmm. you know a tenth of that because they step on it just like any other. Uh, I know it's not a recreational drug, but things that are sold in the street, right? What people forget is the bodybuilders, and I'm not picking on everybody, but in general, the bodybuilders of old, what were they trying to do? They were trying to become as big as possible. And even if they weren't try, trying to become as big as possible, today's athlete wants to be you know, leaner and, and more ripped. But what are they doing for a living? Typically, you know, the top guys are not working uh, you know, a nine to five or certainly an eight to seven desk job uh, under a lot of stress. They're working out, they're eating, and they're sleeping. And what else, you know, and there's an expression, uh, idle mind is devil's playground. Mm. You know, the, the fact of the matter is, and I'm going to get a lot of flack for this, I know, but it's the truth. And, and if anyone's out in that uh, field, they'll know. A lot of recreational drugs come in there. You know, guys are getting involved with, in, in my generation, you know, we knew a lot of guys that were getting involved in Nubane was, was the drug. The painkiller, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's the recreational drugs that are biting them in the butt, not the testosterone. Okay. You know? Okay. Interesting. And again, you can do anything in excess. I'm not saying that's not the case, but really, you're probably more apt to harm yourself with excess aspirin use than excess uh, anabolic steroid use. Okay. So, so uh, back to the other question I had, which is, uh, what are some of the mistakes you see in the TRT space where you know doctors are, are giving patients testosterone? Underdosing. So one of the first things wow. doctors do is they go, okay, well, you know. This is what happened to me. You're 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 at uh, 400, and uh, we're going to shoot for uh, X, and uh, you know whatever X is for that doctor. Is, let's call it 800 uh, nanograms per deciliter of total T. That's what we're shooting for. We're going to give you what we would consider the difference. Well, your body is working on uh, like a like a thermostat, and it'll just simply go great. Now I have to do even less work. And so initially you might get a bump and then your pituitary realizes, okay, no need to send as much luteinizing hormone to the testicles and you drop back down to 400 again or sometimes even less depending so on the that's what happened to me. So yeah. I went lower. Right, because so you suppressed gave, it. Yeah, they gave me, so that's what I thought was really fascinating. I think the first time I tested, I was like, I want to say 412 was my number. And they gave me 150 milligrams of uh, testosterone. On day seven, when we would uh, we would retest, I actually fell down to 398, 406, <laughs> and then they would just keep. In, they would then they moved me to like 160, then 170, and I was. And I think when they finally got me to 180, which was right before I met you, I was still four. I was still coming around 440 or something. But I was yeah. They had, initially it was crashing me lower than what when I even started. So it has to do with uh, the dose, you know, 
and the timing of the dosing, of course. And you can imagine what I saw with uh, like daily dosing of the gels and stuff where it almost act li acted like um, uh, or, uh, hormonal oral birth control for females where you've got a, a smidgen of something, but it's enough of a smidgen of estrogen, for example, that suppresses her endogenous production. That was what was happening to you. And it happens a lot with uh, physicians who think that way. Okay, you have to, again, think of it like a thermostat in order to dose properly. And then, of course, you have people that, as I said earlier, either, you know, a cheap date or an expensive date yeah. that might be metabolizing it more quickly. So that's probably um, the biggest mistake uh, doctors make. And then the other one is, and it's part and parcel of that, shooting for a certain number that's within the reference interval. You're no longer normal once you're on TRT. Okay, again, who wants to be normal? Mm. But, you know, those reference intervals are for people that are producing their own testosterone. We've known since the 1950s, and I'm certain of this, that in order to resolve uh, the, the complaints that most people come in with, to get clinical benefit, in other words, you have to hit, and this is back in the 50s, they would use the total testosterone, at least 800 nanograms per deciliter, total T. Now, when I say hit it, I'm talking about maintaining a level above that. So that's the minimum above which you want to maintain. So that's the threshold, wow. right? So if you're using Sipionate, for example, on a weekly basis, that's the number you want to be at on day seven or day one, however you want to call it, the day you're going to do your injection, but before you do your injection. Okay, you don't want to drop below that. Now, I would argue that in today's world where we use free tea, which is roughly, uh, on, especially on someone uh, using TRT, 2% of, of total T, um, I, you know, I think you're shooting for, at least in my experience, for clinical benefit, the patient to be optimized, somewhere around 28, maybe even 32 picograms per milliliter of, of free T. And again, I'm just using numbers here, right? I don't care what the number is. If you come in and you say you're feeling great and your free T's at 16 on day seven, I don't care to adjust it, mm -hmm. right. okay? But again, if we're using numbers, that's that's the number that seems to alleviate most of the symptoms that guys are complaining about. Now, again, I'm giving you guys numbers. Um, and, and for guys, the total T um, is probably going to be at least double high normal during the course of the week. Okay. For females, it gets even more interesting because they're going to be probably at triple high normal of that reference interval, right? Uh, to get to a therapeutic range. And it freaks physicians out, you know, primary care physicians who aren't in charge of this and the patients themselves, unless we warn them that, hey, this is the number you're going to see on your total. But again, their free T, uh, females I'm talking about, will be usually within the range, which is, you know, uh, up to 4.2, say, picograms per milliliter. Uh, and again, who cares about the number? But I'm just giving you the number. Right. That's, that's where they seem to, that's the sweet spot, uh, the, the, the therapeutic threshold above which they have to maintain to, to feel better. Wow. Now I have a question. I'm probably the most ignorant out of the three of us in terms of like anabolic steroids and bodybuilding. And, you know, I come from a little bit more of a sports background where I was told to just avoid them completely. Right. Uh, I was wondering just for myself and for the, the audience in terms of like what the options are out there for anabolic steroids and what each one has in terms of their characteristics versus the other. You mentioned like DECA and testosterone and like, what are the other ones that are kind of out there? And you know, what are sort of the pros or cons of all these things? Great question. So there's a, a there's a bunch of great steroids out there, anabolic steroids. And before I go in any further, so, so people use that term loosely, right? Steroids. Well, testosterone, estrogen, DHEA, progesterone, pregnenolone, they're all steroids. Isn't cholesterol a steroid even? I well, cholesterol is the, the molecule from which we derive the word steroid, like cholesterol, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. steroid, right? So all these hormones that we're talking about, yeah, are made from cholesterol. So that's different than an anabolic steroid to which you're referring, right? A, a molecule that usually is either a testosterone molecule or often enough a dihydrotestosterone molecule that's been jiggered in such a way by you know removing or adding a ligand along the molecule so that when it goes into the cell, uh, it, you know, it, it operates differently, we'll say, than a typical testosterone molecule. And, and what we mean operating differently is typically, it, you know, more of the anabolic properties will be emphasized, those that build muscle, accrete mass, rather than uh, the, the androgenic side effects, the secondary male sex characteristics, we call it, you know, that, you know, uh, uh, accentuate, you know, the hair on the ears we get after we're in our 30s and stuff like that, you know, the, the weird stuff that none of us likes, balding yeah. and stuff like that. Um, so 
there are a bunch of different anabolics that have been developed. Unfortunately, we're limited as to what we can use in the United States. Um, there are roughly, let's see, four that are used. Uh, there are more than that that are actually legal. For example, there's something called halitestin, which I have no idea why everyone, anyone would ever want to use it. A lot of bodybuilders do because uh, it makes you, and I'll put it mildly, kind of edgy. And if you're power lifters like to use that one, I heard, I guess it makes them aggressive, ramps them up. Right. Yeah. So, huh. you know, bodybuilders, power, power lifters is a great example. Uh, you know, they'll use smelling salts to, to perk themselves up, if you will, mm -hmm. right before a lift. Same idea with halitestin with bodybuilders. It's more for, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm sucking wind here cause I'm not eating prior to the show and they want anything to get them through a workout. It's unfortunately really rough on the liver. And again, I, you know, it, it can make you <laughs> edgy, an understatement, it can make you homicidal. So again, halitestin, I, I, I would say, hey, eschew that and have a extra espresso before workout instead. But we have some good uh, anabolics that are useful for wasting disorders. I mean, that's what their standard, uh, their, 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 their indication is, right? Cachexia and wasting disorders, burn victims. So uh, oxandrolone used to be known as Anavar is mm. one of the best ones out there because not only is it anabolic in nature, it's also catabolic in nature. So you can actually put on muscle and lose fat at the same time, sort of the the, the, the holy grail of what yeah, most people magical. in life would like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's um, it can be used in females too. It's one of those that's a dihydrotestosterone derivative and it doesn't convert to estrogen, therefore, it doesn't affect the, the the receptors, you know, for dihydrotestosterone. So it's what we would consider a clean anabolic steroid. Uh, it's also, again, very useful for females because it doesn't convert to estrogen. So if someone has had an estrogen sensitive cancer, uh, they can use it without fear of, of, you know, propagating cancer yet again, an estrogen sensitive mm -hmm. cancer. So in that way, it's, it's a wonder drug. Um, a lot of bodybuilders use it prior to a show because that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to lose fat and hold that muscle. Uh, there's one related to that called uh, stenozolol, which used to go by the brand name Winstrol. And that one is very similar to oxandrolone, except it also, one of the indications is for angioedema. So it gets rid of the extra water, the third space water, the kind of water you don't want, not the water that stays in the cell, but the, the, one, the water that's in between cells. And so bodybuilders like to use that a lot too, or, or track athletes. Like that's what Ben Johnson got banned from the Olympics or whatever. Yep. Got his gold medal taken yep. away for that. Uh, yeah, and it I makes sense, that. right? You would use that one over Anavar. Why? Because any athlete like that wants to carry as little extra as possible, yet still maintain the muscle mass and lose the fat, right? So mm. uh, that makes sense for, for track athletes to use Winstrol. Plus, I think it tends to pep you up a little bit too. That's just been my experience. And that's a le that's a, that's, you can prescribe that in the U.S.? Yes. Okay. Uh, you can prescribe an oral form. You cannot prescribe an injectable form. And I may not be the the one to to quote when it comes to the legal aspects of this, because okay. um, uh, it might have changed. But that's my understanding: is that you know uh, you can't do the injectable for some. I, I guess that's only for animals or something. There's some rationale behind it. I don't know. Okay. And by the way, you can't get an injectable Anavar either, which baffles me sometimes because I think it would be more useful. Um, in some ways for, especially if you ever had to use a higher dose, like for a burn victim, uh, there's a lot of talk about how these are, are hard on the liver because they're oral steroids and they're alkylated a certain way. In my experience, I've never seen um, elevations in, in liver enzymes because of these when used the way they're supposed to be used. And this will be probably more helpful for the nerds out there, but AST and ALT are typically referred to as liver enzymes. And yet you can have elevated AST and ALT because of just muscle tissue breakdown. Mm. And so a lot of times people who are on anabolic steroids have more turnover of muscles, certainly, yeah. right? And so, oh, look, that anabolic you're on is causing liver issues. No, it's not. And an easy way for physicians who are listening or anyone else uh, to verify that is to get a GGT, which won't be elevated for muscle tissue breakdown, okay? And it's specific to, uh, well, the liver, but also pancreas, biliary tract, mm. et cetera. So you use that to, to compare and go, oh, look, my GGT is well within normal limits, but my AST and ALT are mildly elevated. Uh, you, you, you can assume that things are safe. And there's other ways to prove that, by the way. You can do a liver ultrasound to make sure it's not too fatty, which, by the way, is one of the, the typical side effects. Probably the most dangerous thing about an anabolic steroid is fatty liver. Mm. Okay. 
which tends to resolve after you get off the anabolic steroid. And it all makes sense because what do anabolic steroids do? They help pack glycogen into muscles, right? So that they it become also due to the liver then, I guess. better later. But well, wow. the next step up after, once the muscle's filled for the moment, the next step up is to store the energy in the form of glycogen in the liver. So hmm. you can build a fatty liver uh, fairly early and I'll keep rambling here. Let me, let me just mm -hmm. ramble a little bit more because this, I think your audience will appreciate this too. And I learned this from Franco Colombo way back in the day, God rest his soul. Um, you know, bodybuilders, like I said, and especially back in the day used to just want to get big. So you do a lot of lifting, a lot of eating and a lot of sitting around. Well, you could very easily develop a fatty liver. And so they all knew after an anabolic steroid cycle to use something called, uh, uh, back then it was just an acetal and choline. Mm. They're nowadays still considered pretty much a B vitamin, although they're still arguing about how to classify them. Now we add another amino acid called L-methionine and we call them midcaps. 30 days of these midcaps in a high dose where you're using 3,000 milligrams of inositol and choline and 1,500 of L-methionine every day for 30 days, divided all at once, and you'll get a squeaky clean liver. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, fascinating. And I say that's this because, I mean, fatty liver, the latest estimates is that 100 million Americans, that's a lot of us, have fatty liver, and yet there's no pharmaceutical cure. I don't care what they market it as, and I'm not naming names, but I'm telling you right now, we don't have anything to compare to these two simple so, excuse me, three simple ingredients. Over the you can counter, get over too. the counter. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and not harmful. All right. Oh. Now, there are others. <clears throat> so, back to your question, there's uh, Nandrolone, which used to be branded as Decadrolone, which is an injectable steroid, great for um, just putting on mass. It's, it's essentially anabolic without being catabolic as well, like stenozolol and, 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 uh, and, and oxandrolone. And I use H, uh, for HIV patients, it's fantastic because you can put on, you know, 20, 25 pounds of extra weight. In someone that, you know, unfortunately they can get, uh, uh, go through a bout uh, of illness and that 25 uh, pounds can be a lifesaver. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a no brainer yeah. and uh, very little risk with, uh, I mean, what are the risks with, with Nandrolone? I say very little. Um, you know, according to the medicine, that elevation in lipids, uh, the bad lipids, the, uh, the LDL is supposed to be a bad thing. Uh, but, you know, again, for reasons we talked about earlier, I would argue that's a bunch of bunk. And so it's a no brainer for someone with HIV who's, you know, underweight or even, you know, midweight to put a few extra pounds on if it's not stressing the heart or something like that. So, uh, and then the other one, which again, I don't understand why you'd necessarily want to ever prescribe it is something called Anadrol. Uh, oxymethylone, is that the name? I've, yeah, I've never written a prescription for it in my life. Um, God, I, I heard that. That was referred to, God, this is back in the 90s. I had this bodybuilder that worked for me, and they called it Gorilla Roids. That was the nickname <laughs> they gave Anadrol. Well, isn't that, was that, am I, isn't that five? Didn't wow. you say four? Or there's not five right there, right? There's, there's the, the, Anadrol? That's five now, yeah. Oh, yeah. five. Because I, I said there's four that make sense. Halitacin oh, right. oh, so makes no make sense, 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 sense to me. Got and it. And Anadrol makes no sense. And there are other ones that are legal. There's something called Danazol, which is, is, is called an anabolic steroid, but I don't see anything anabolic about it what i use it for uh rarely but i've still used it is if someone's on trt and their free testosterone is on the low side in terms of percentage like it might be one and a half percent instead of two percent for some odd reason i'll throw in a little bit of uh danosol which really wouldn't do anything except reduce shbg which is binding the the, the total oh, yeah. testosterone so that the free testosterone comes up but uh, Anadrol, I, you said it was, uh, what did you call it? Gorilla, Gorilla juice. Is what Gorilla. It really is. I, I call it dinosaur juice, man. I don't know why <laughs> anyone would want to be on that. But it's for people that are really having a hard, hard time putting on weight. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the indication I think is for, uh, I want to say pernicious anemia. And there's so many other ways to treat pernicious anemia than putting them on Anadrol, which by the way, has a major side effect for a lot of guys. It doesn't convert to estrogen. But it seems to activate the estrogen receptor somehow. And it makes guys just absolutely, you know, crazy. The, the so-called roid rage that people talk about, by the way, is typically not because of anabolic steroids. Now, halitestin can have that, that side effect to it, if you will. I'd say that has a profile that makes guys aggressive, no doubt. But um, it's really estrogen out of control that turns Dr. Jekyll into Mr. Hyde. You know, the guy at the gym who puts on 30 pounds, yeah. uh, all of a sudden becomes really red faced and puffy. Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, at the water fountain used to be a nice guy. Now he's a jerk. Mm -hmm. uh, th that, that's typically because he hasn't controlled his estrogen properly, not because of the anabolic steroids. And think about it. Mm -hmm. The guys at the big yoke guys in the gym, they're doing it right. Don't look like that and don't act like that. And, and, you know, as guys, we can talk about, well, why would he? He knows he's huge. He can kick everyone's butt in the gym. Why would he get aggro? 
over anything. You know, he's, he's like happy go lucky. Right. Testosterone makes you feel that way. But anyway, that, that's the answer to your question. I, I hope. I mean, those yeah, words. Where, no, where, I have a follow up to that. But. Where does uh, Boulderon fall on that? Like, I didn't, we didn't not, touch? not, that's considered contraband uh, for humans anyway in this it's country. It's a veterinary. Equipoise, yeah, is what it's yeah. used for. Um, just like the injectable windstraw is for. Uh, uh, would you compare that to like deck? Is it more like DECA or what would it, it be? It is. It is. It's got a structure similar to, to, to DECA Dirobler and Nandrolone, um, but it can convert more easily. You know, everyone says Nandrolone doesn't convert at all, but I think roughly 20% of it can convert to an estrogen. Uh, Boldenone um, can convert more readily to estrogen, but it 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 uh, it doesn't come with the side effect that everyone dreads with Nandrolone. We haven't talked about that. Yeah. Sorry, I skipped that side effect. Decadroblin oh, comes with yeah. They call oh, it decadec. Yeah. Okay. Erectile dysfunction because uh, for a lot of men, particularly the same ones that would react to negatively to finasteride or dutasteride, Proscar, uh, Propecia, and um, uh, dutasteride goes Avidart. Mm. Um, they don't produce enough uh, dihydrotestosterone and have erectile dysfunction, which, by the way, is not as prevalent as you would believe based upon all the press. But it does happen. And so with, with nandrolone, you get conversion to dihydronandrolone, which is very, very um, similar um, to uh, – well, it's very, very weak in effect. So it's, it, it, it binds to the receptor that DHT would go to. Oh. But it, but uh, so it occupies the receptor, so DHT can't go do its job. Yeah, and so some guys will react to to nandrolone with what they call yeah decadec, based upon the old yeah. brand name to it. Yeah. Wow. So I've also seen the this rise in SARMs, and I wanted to, to see if you could kind of go over that in terms of what you've seen, uh, the reasoning why people use them, and then also like maybe like some potential, uh, you know, negative effects of that. SARMs are not my favorite. Now, I say that pleading ignorance because I can't keep up with all the SARMs. Guys are inventing these peptides uh, more frequently than I, I can study them. And I knew this was coming because when I was still in, uh, gosh, doing my, my prereqs prior to medical school, I can remember walking down the building uh, in the physics department, in, at physics department, mind you, in CSUN, and they had all these pictures of peptides on the wall, these different hormones and whatnot. Why is this in the physics department? Well, because peptides are made like uh, Lincoln Logs, I think they are, or not Tinker Toys, whatever. But you know, you, the one that you could put together different angles yeah, and all these yeah, things. Yeah. And 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 the sky's the limit as to what you can invent with peptides. And and these uh, these SARMs uh, that they're coming up with, all these peptides typically uh, are are going into the cell and doing all kinds of things. We haven't thoroughly tested them, so there's a reason right there where you go, hey. Be careful, guys, you know, with what you're buying out right. there. Not only have they been, haven't been tested, but who knows how they're being made and what's coming with them, you know, in terms of uh, excipients and other, you know, toxic uh, uh, con constituents. And, and again, I don't mean to, 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 to wave the, 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 what, the, 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 the prude button, but, you know, be careful. You know, yeah, but a guy like you has got to get almost annoyed seeing that because I yeah. would think with all your extensive knowledge with, with hormones and knowing how much we've researched all these ones that you just talked about, there's so much more that we know about that compared to these SARMs, not to mention uh, what we know as far as side effects and stuff, but also how much more effective like regular hormones are. So like, why would you want to yeah, take more risk for less results? Like, this, it doesn't make sense to me. Well, and that, that's really what I come to uh, at the end of the discussion, you know, practicality rules. Uh, we did a study, uh, and a former partner of mine, uh, with some athletes that volunteered and a supplier of Osterine. And uh, it wasn't an IRB, it was just a voluntary deal where a guy said, hey, let's try this. And um, it was, you know, it, now the dose was by the manufacturer, suggested at 25 milligrams, which I think is still what they use. And to your point, they had uh, less result than even being on TRT and certainly than an anabolic. And uh, the side effects were worse if you want to consider the effect on the lipids worse. So the HDL plunged even more, the LDL went up even more, hmm. and you don't get the same benefit. Why? Now, I speculate it's because of good old American values of, hey, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. And people, and I get it, I'm a registered libertarian, don't want to have to ask a doctor for a prescription. 
Yeah. And so they get these SARMs and the way they want to get them. And, and I, God bless them. But again, to your point, why not do what works? It's okay. I get it. It's, 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 it's what we have to deal with. I make a living at it. You have to go through the gatekeeper and, and, you know, qualify to get this particular substance and all that. But uh, yeah, when there are, when it's an inferior product, I, I argue, okay, this is not the right battle to fight. Let, you know, go, go, go somewhere else. Now with the new SARMs though, that I'm ignorant of, there's a lot of them, you know, even things like Rad 140, they've been around for a while. I got people saying, wow, this is great. And I, I just don't have enough experience with them to tell you, oh yeah, it is better than say Oxandrolone or something. I will say that a lot of those guys that test out these SARMs though, have never done an anabolic, the ones that I talk to. Um, and also they're often stacking. So what well, was it, the Rad 140? Or was it the Rad 140 and the Ibutamorin and the BPC157, or better yet, the, the Thymosin Beta 4? You know, what did what? And this is a big problem in the bodybuilding community because we're stacking now, unlike yeah. we used to in my era, where again, because we couldn't get it or we couldn't afford it, we did one thing at a time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let, let's talk a little bit about how testosterone is administered because the old way, which is... It, from what I've read, the best way, which is injecting. So you inject it intramuscularly. But then they've come out with creams that you rub on your skin. There's, uh, I think they're called, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, trouches. Am I pronouncing that right? Or pouches? They're like, they're. I, I call them trochies or troches. Troches. There you, know, you go. Trochies, like, I think, is, is, excuse me, I think actually the way people say it, but I think if you look it up, I think it's from the French. I think you're supposed to say. Troche. Something like that. Yeah, okay. yeah. The, the common pronunciation is trochee, so okay. let's just stick with that. So, and, you, and I guess it's like you, you put it in your gum and it absorbs, you know, through the mucous membranes of the, the mouth or whatever. Um, there's tablets. Like, what's the best form of administration from a, you know, getting the testosterone levels where you want, getting people to feel the best type of, you know, context? And safest. Yeah, so as always, it's individualized. But in general... Uh, I would argue that for a male, the best way is through an intramuscular injection of a, a sterified form of testosterone, like a cypionate or an enanthate, which are pretty similar. Um, it works out on a weekly basis. Just It just so happens it works out pretty well for, for most patients. So you just remember, okay, every Sunday I'm going to do my injection. Mm -hmm. We have another ester called undecanoate, which has proven to be just a hassle to try and even, try and even find it. But it's a much longer lasting um, ester. They also use them uh, orally, but for the injectable, which would mean, okay, presumably you could maybe inject every three weeks instead of a week. You just can't get it. And I think it might have something to do with uh, one of the warnings is that it can create, um, uh, what's the word? Um, uh I think, the, I think the warning says it might cause a thrombus, okay. which is going to scare a lot of people, including docs away. Um, and I don't know why that's on there because um, that, that opens up a whole other can of worms about testosterone because that's one of the things that a lot of doctors claim also that, oh, well, you can increase your risk of stroke. And, and this rise in hemoglobin hematocrit is evidence of that. If you talk to a hemodologist, they'll laugh. Okay, you know, increased viscosity does not mean that you're going to get a stroke. And, and while we're on the topic, or I, I brought us on the topic, I'll say, two studies that I'm aware of uh, will, will, will clearly show that, uh, depending upon the studies, either six months or nine months in, for those six or nine months, if you have a pre-existing uh, issue with blood, a coagulopathy, an issue with uh, uh, clotting too easily, then it will exacerbate it for six to nine months, and it goes back to the normal risk of anyone else, mm. right? So again, did testosterone cause that? No more than it, than LDL causes coronary artery disease. No, it can contribute to it if you have a pre-existing condition, but these are typically very rare. As a matter of fact, the, the standard human being has um, what we call um, uh, is heterozygous for a clotting disorder, Leiden factor five. So it's normal for most of us to have one Leiden factor five gene and not. So the, the other coagulopathies are even more rare Okay, and those are the ones we're talking about. So the, the my point is, the the chances of you having an issue with clotting when you take testosterone are very very low, such that anyone who uh, administers it typically doesn't even test for these things. Mm. Okay, interesting. You could argue that you should maybe because uh, of the slight increased risk, but even then, those that have the coagulopathy, the increased risk of 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 a thrombus form form forming at all is also very very 
small. So again, mm-hmm. I think that's why we ignore it. Let's, so let's talk about the change in quality of life that someone, a man, and we'll get to women because I really want to get to that because I think there's mm-hmm. way more stigma with women uh, using testosterone, of course, than men. But Amen. let's start with men for, for, a, for a second here. A guy comes and sees you, low testosterone, signs of low testosterone. He goes on therapy. What kind of changes in quality of life do you typically see? With, and I know it's an individual, but what, what is typically seen with somebody who goes yeah, on TRT? The, the basics are, hey, doc, I've got low energy. And I shouldn't say low energy because the, the, the magic word is really decreased whatever it might be. Because one of the reasons why we don't see patients as soon as we should is because we've all seen the guy who's bouncing around the walls, right? Or off the walls. Uh, he's got natural high energy um, and he figures, you know, he looks at his, his buddy, uh, Ralph, and goes, geez, man, Ralph's fat and out of shape on the couch. I'm still working out. I got tons of energy. Nothing wrong with me. It's just old age, right? Mm. He shouldn't compare himself to anybody else. He should compare himself to him and say, hey, man, how am I doing compared to 10, 15, 20 years ago? Do I have a decrease in my libido, my energy level, my sense of well-being, uh, my ability to change my body composition, which the first three are, are personality traits, you could argue, right? And influence therefrom. But change in body composition, that's not, a, I mean, indirectly uh, driven by your personality. Do you get your butt into the gym or not, right? right. But that one, like you got a guy who, especially a, a successful athlete, who knows all the right things to do and just keeps saying, well, I'll just try harder. I'll do mm-hmm. more of this. I'll do more of that. They're the last ones to come in. And, and really, they're the ones that would probably benefit more than anybody to come in sooner. So, so those are the, I guess I call them, uh, four things that most people complain about. Now, connected to that, though, you know, uh, an increased sense of well-being, um, that can affect your sleep. When you wake up in the middle of the night and think about your 2.3 kids and a mortgage and go, oh, my God, how am I going to get through this? You know, when things are going well, you go, shut up, brain. I'll handle it like I always do when I get up in the morning and kick butt because I feel good. I'm wake up feeling like I'm, I'm, I'm kicking butt. When you have the flu, for example, you don't wake up and think, I mean, the world becomes a horrible place for 10 days, right? Mm-hmm. Why? Not because the world's changed. And you know, when the flu goes away, the world's great again, right? It's because you don't feel well. And when you're off because of low T, you wake up and you start ruminating about that. Like, oh, yeah. You know, how am I going to make that car payment? And you think, you go, hey, I got plenty of time to think about that. Why do I need to think about it in the middle of the night? They're going to send me a nice little letter telling me that my car's going to be repossessed long before it happens. Mm -hmm. You get my meaning. I mean, these are the things that come along with low testosterone that people don't even think about. And once they start on therapy, they go, hey, by the way, I didn't talk about it the first time I saw you, but I'm sleeping a lot better now, too. And there's things that come with that because they're working out more often. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, that helps you get into a deeper sleep. Things we know that come with the other things that you're doing that can be indirectly because of the testosterone therapy. But th- those are those are the main things. So feel better, more the li- higher libido, greater sense of well-being, confidence. Yeah. Okay. And again, compare yourself to yourself, not to your buddies. Think about it. I mean, when was the last time you played uh, poker on a Saturday night with your buddies? The little things that start to go, you say, wait a minute, I'm doing fine. I'm keeping up with my business. I'm doing all the things I, I, I used to do. Well, wait a minute. No, I am keeping up with my business, but I used to be able to do that. And like I say, see my buddies for an occasion, you know, a monthly poker match. Mm. You know, those things start falling off. And again, it's for the people that tend to be tougher to begin with that, you uh, you know, rationalize that stuff and probably postpone their, their Oh, I their was trip. that guy. I was 100% mm-hmm. that guy. You know, I, wait, I waited longer than I probably should have because I thought, oh, well, give myself more time to probably naturally bring it back up. Oh, I was still kind of working out and being somewhat consistent with that. So I'm doing better than this guy. Like, I kept justifying in my head like that. But the two big things that I, I noticed that uh, what, what finally kicked me into gear to go finally do it was just my my drive to even want to get in the gym. You know, for most all my 20s, I, I, I used to, I remember thinking about my workout the night before because I couldn't wait to go lift. I was, ex- I was excited to train. I was in love with it. And I had lost a lot of that, you know, and yet I was still disciplining myself to come in and go. Uh, my desire to do it, I had lost. And then, of course, all the other ones you touched on, like I noticed all of those things uh, dramatically increased. The other thing that was really pushed me in that direction is as a trainer and doing this as long as I have, I know how I need to eat. I know how I need to train, uh, train to change my body composition and pretty quick too. I can get it in there. And that's what I was like really getting frustrated with is one, the drive to get in and then two, 
two, when I was in and I was being consistent and I was eating the ways, my body just was not responding the way it had in the past. And that's what broke me down. If I go, okay, I think I need some help. I don't think I'm going to be able to figure this out myself. But what about the other thing I was talking about? Did you also look around and go, and I, I, I know you'll answer this, so I'll do humility. I'll, I'll, I'll tee that up for you. But you also, you look around and you go, well, I'm still kicking ass here. Well, I'm that's still way better than, you know, the 95, 99% of the people in there. So you go, and again, it's not to say I'm great, but just to go, okay, well, maybe it is just because I'm getting older, you know, or uh, this is just what I'm sh supposed to expect. And to some degree, like we talked about earlier, it is normal, mm -hmm. but it, it it's not what you have to do. You have to suffer through, right? No, you you're 100% right. You know. That's exactly what I did was, you know, I'm approaching 40. I'm the youngest of my friends. So all my friends are in their 40s. And I'm looking at, even though I'm feeling all these things, not feeling great, not I don't have the drive, not body's not changing, I'm still in a better position than all of them. And so I'm going, oh, okay, well, maybe it is. I'm just getting older and all those mm -hmm. things are just inevitably going to decline for me. Yeah. So let's get back. Let's talk to women, about women now because mm -hmm. uh, I know women can also suffer from low testosterone and benefit from testosterone therapy, but is a huge stigma around uh, around treating women. Um, they're afraid, of course, of turning into a man and mm. growing a bunch of facial hair and all kinds of weird stuff. What are some of the symptoms that women go through and how do they feel afterwards? Is it very similar to what men will feel? Yeah, this is actually the saddest part. And we're actually making a very concerted effort to to reach out and appeal to women more because actually when I started, I had more women in my practice than men. Oh, but I, I think maybe because of the stigma that you refer to, you know, they, they just uh, they, they don't get the, the right push. They don't get the right answers. And, and they're kind of left in the lurch the the symptoms they suffer from are the same as for guys. That lack of libido, energy, sense of well-being, you know, call it joie de vivre, whatever you want. And the ability to, to change their body composition falls off the same way it happens with guys. The problem is, yeah, we were kind of reared to to look at the, the hormones, the so-called sex hormones, right? As testosterone is male, estrogen is female. Right. When in fact, we both have the same hormones, okay? Just different ratios. We men carry estrogen and testosterone in our bodies, just more testosterone than estrogen and the reverse for females. So that, that one, yeah, that, that one's very unfortunate. And like I said earlier, I, I, I see you're all just picking up the ball for the men, but I don't see OBGYNs picking up the, the ball for females. And so, the, like I say, they're kind of left in the lurch. And there's a lot of misconception out there. Um, you know, oh, God, I'm going to grow a beard. Oh, gosh, I'm going to turn into Arnold Schwarzenegger in terms of my body composition, <laughs> which, I mean, if you just think about how ridiculous that one is, I mean, Arnold, you know, like him or not, uh, you had to work for that. You know, it's not going to happen overnight, <laughs> man. You know, you got to put in some effort. Any bodybuilder will tell you that. <laughs> And so, uh, but you know, they're, they're legitimate fears because also there are, there are I'll call, well, there are doctors that are writing protocols that are not aware of the potential side effects. And, you know, while men and women have hair in the same places, you know, women just a lot less of it typically, uh, depending upon their phenotype, et cetera. Um, you know, that, that's a fear because women don't want to have facial hair for now in this country. I don't think they ever have in the history of, of, of civilization, but. I mentioned that because, you know, you look at, uh, you know, uh, what, 16th century paintings and, you know, women were kind of booksome back then, whereas today, you know, or just 20 years ago, Twiggy was was supposed to right. be the ideal body type. So things change. But anyway, as of today, women <laughs> don't want to have beards, right? And, and so that's a fear. And, and while it will not cause a beard, it can... And it's, by the way, it's not the testosterone that will, f will, will facilitate this uh, extra growth. Is something that testosterone gets converted into called dihydrotestosterone that that it's the fly in the ointment. Mm -hmm. So if and, and by the way, like I said earlier, you know, unless it's a very unusual female, she's got two or three somewhere on her face, right? Mm -hmm. Like grandma did when she was 35, they appeared, but you didn't see them until at 75. She says, I just don't care anymore. Yeah. You know, I've lived <laughs> yeah. long enough, she you take me as I am. Them. Yeah, she <laughs> stops plucking them, then you notice them, right? Most of the females will have some of this, even if it's just sort of sideburns. Uh, my point being that um, it's driven by dihydrotestosterone, of course, first and foremost by the genes. Um, and, and it's not the testosterone, but we can block the conversion from testosterone into dihydrotestosterone. You don't have to suffer from these side effects. And unfortunately, you know, yeah, we do fix a lot of bad haircuts when it comes to female TRT because they'll go to a doctor that hasn't really given it anything but short shrift uh, in terms of study 
and they put them on testosterone. They go, oh my God, that was a disaster. Yes, I love the energy and I love the libido, but my God, I got acne, which is also driven by dihydrotestosterone. And I don't think either sex likes acne, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what about the low voice? What's the mechanism there? Again, dihydrotestosterone is what drives that. Di dihydrotestosterone is two to five times more potent than testosterone in terms of uh, potency dis and, and depending upon the receptor, right? It's a masculinizing hormone, essentially. Yeah, I mean, that's what we refer to it. The, the male sex, uh, secondary sex characteristics are driven by uh, that particular hormone uh, more than any other. It's an androgen. And uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's an issue. So uh, the good news is, for those that are on it and are not and are suffering with some of these side effects or those who are planning on getting on it and worried about them, we can stop that conversion and therefore prevent the side effects. Or you really kind of have about a six month window in which you can reverse them, I've found. So if mm. someone's starting to notice, oh, my my voice is getting deeper mm. uh, because of the thickening of the vocal cords, then we can put them on something to stop the DHT. Oh, interesting. And, and uh, you got about a six month window. And by the way, this is what I tell all patients. You can stop and that extra hair growth will go away. Okay. Mm -hmm. And usually I'm stopped mid sentence and go, yeah, yeah, you told me that, but never mind. I'll, I'll just get more laser. Well, okay, wait a minute. I also told you you don't have to get the laser either. Mm -hmm. If we put you on a substance, it's usually finasteride or dutasteride. Uh, the older docs used to use something called spironolactone, which is a, um, is a diuretic, a potassium sparing diuretic. Uh, they used to use it uh, ubiquitously for, for females in acne because they know that as a side effect, it blocks, and only works in females, by the way, dihydrotestosterone formation. Uh, I don't think any of anybody needs to be dehydrated necessarily. I mean, unless they have hypertension uh, and we can use it as an adjunct, but uh, most athletes, yeah, that's, that's one of your worst enemies is dehydration. So I don't use uh, the, the, the diuretics anymore, but finasteride or dutasteride even works great to block uh, dihydrotestosterone. Again, people think of it as a male drug, but it works the same in the female. Mm. And um, so a female walks in and she complains similar to like maybe what my complaints were, low energy, mood, libido all down, body composition, struggling to change. Um, what does, a, and I know of course there's a variance, but what is kind of a normal dose of testosterone look like for a female to help her rebound from all those things roughly one tenth the dose of a male is oh, what wow. it works out to yeah so, so like 20 milligrams or something like that right yeah we'll use a testosterone sipping eight 20 milligrams per ml per week that's and a for tiny amount yeah well and that's why we got to have it uh in a different strength because to be precise is difficult with 200 megs per ml so uh, we have to we have to give them a different strength, and actually we can get it uh, we can get away with fifty megs per mL, and just use uh, you know point uh, four mLs, and it's precise enough to be accurate. So, uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much the secret there. And and by the way, we were talking about the different uh, delivery systems uh, for men, without a doubt, clinically you're going to see much better result with the the injectable, anything that's esterified. With women. Uh, because it's a smaller amount of testosterone required is, is what I imagine part of the reason is anyway, you can get away with the, the, the creams or and gels or even orals. Yeah. Because again, the argument is that, you know, less stress on the liver. I don't think there really is. I mean, you could argue with methylated test when the original, original testosterone orals, yeah, it was hard on the liver. Um, but any of the others, I, I don't think you have an issue with, but given that argument, you know, okay you want to select one of the others first. But, uh, you know, there's still the drawback of you got to put it on, wait for five minutes for it to be, uh, to dry anyway, and then another 25, let's say, to have it be fully absorbed before you can go, you know, swimming or exercising or whatever. Um, you know, I joke, I dropped my candy by not investing in Sephora because my wife puts on a cream every day, several <laughs> creams, you know, I'm like, oh, geez. And so, uh, you know, uh, you know, male or female, you know, some are like, okay, what's another cream? Big deal. But there's some that say, no, hey, man, if I can avoid one more cream, I'll do the once a week injection. But in terms of efficacy, I don't see much difference for a female, whether they use an injectable or, or a cream or a gel. So they're taking about 20 milligrams. And then what are you, what else are they taking in order to block the, the DHI? DHT. Uh, D, no, DHI, I thought testosterone. What'd you call no, it? No, DHT. DHT, yeah, I heard testosterone. Yeah. Sorry, I'll stop with the, 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 the abbreviations. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, I don't put them on a, a, a dihydrotestosterone blocker. We call it a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor 
typically unless they complain or they've had experience where they say, oh, I did it with this doctor and man, I got acne or man, oh, I started okay. getting hair in the wrong places. Then I'll say, okay, well, we know that's in your genes. That's what's going to happen to you. Let's put you on from the get go. Oh, okay. But it only happens in about uh, say 20, maybe 25% of the females or males for that matter that have side effects. So I don't put people on immediately, but we have a feature in the, in the, in the uh, charting system. It's a uh, patient health record. I think it's called where we can message. So I say to patients, hey, as soon as you see anything you even think is a side effect, communicate with us and we'll put you on right away. But, you know, if we start people on it, then based on what I just said, you know, 75 to 80 percent of the people are taking it that don't even need it. Mm. Oh, mm. So, so so what does the process look like? Let's say somebody's watching this or listening and they're like, OK, I have some of those symptoms. Uh, I, I suspect maybe I have low testosterone. I'm eating right, exercising, getting good sleep, but I still feel this way. What does the process look like? They contact your facility and then what kind of testing do they need? How, like, what does that whole thing look like? Well, in order to get a prescription, uh, first of all, again, fortunately, unfortunately, testosterone is considered a controlled substance. It's a schedule three controlled substance. And so you have to have a prescription for it. Uh, in order to get a prescription, you have to have a relationship with a doctor. And in the state of California, you have to establish a relationship with a physician, which involves a history and a physical exam. So those are the hoops you got to jump through. Okay. You, you, you have to see a physician. Um, I say, see, these days you can get a surrogate physical exam from another physician I call it a surrogate so that, you know, your primary care physician you could go into today and then <clears throat> I could use that physical exam tomorrow. Uh, trusting another a fellow physician. Um, and then uh, you and I have to talk about what's going on. You know, there, there has to be a reason for prescribing this. Mm -hmm. So we talk about the symptoms. You know, like I said, it could be that you're, it has nothing to do with your testosterone. There's so many ways. I mean, there's tons of ways to get a headache. There's tons of ways to have low energy and low libido. Sure. So we got to look at uh, typically some labs to help us guide the, the, the decision-making process, the evaluation. But it starts with, as I said, you and your symptoms. What's going on with you? What are your, what are your we call them chief complaints. Hmm. Awesome. So they do that, then they get on. And then I, ima I can only imagine that because, I've, look, I've known several people who've, ha who've gone on TRT and they're just rave about how they feel. I can imagine that the stick rate, in other words, the amount of people that work with you who stay on, it's probably through the roof. Do people tend to fall off or they tend to stick around once they feel the effects? Yeah, someone who was a crummy salesman because I hated rejection. This is a great uh, profession to be in. <laughs> yeah, we have very few people ever drop off because, yeah, it works great, man. So I, have a great, I have a great job. I really do. I don't see sick people, you know. I see people that want to optimize. I mean, sometimes we see people that need to be pulled out of a hole, and that's very, very rewarding. Uh, I have a buddy, um, uh, Joe Rivera, he won't mind. He put all this on, on, on not Instagram, but uh, YouTube. His mom came in on 26 meds, 26 wow. medications. She wow. was taking medicines for medicines. Yeah, okay? I'm that. Mm. And we got her down to four, two of which were only temporary because of something else that was, was only temporary. And, and we got her off. And she came in on a walker, you know, and then ended up, you know, doing the pool and hiking, you know, miles wow. and stuff. It was really, really rewarding, not just because Joe's my buddy, but because you watch an individual who's being overly medicated. Mm -hmm. And by that was an interesting conversation with her physician, too. Um, I speculate you your business to explode from this conversation, because when I started talking about uh, my journey uh, on the show openly and I started to get and I was blown away by this, I told the guys this, that. My, my entire career as a personal trainer in gyms, you know, this is f 15 years ago, uh, when I was working in gyms, I, I never met uh, men under the age of 40 or 50 that would complain about low testosterone. When I started talking about it on the show, I was getting uh, tons of DMs and from young men from men in their 20s who went and got their blood work done and were telling me their their total testosterone was 170, 205, like Ouch. 25 years old, 23. This I was blown away by how many young men were that. And then I, Sal talks about 
uh, the studies that have been coming out about how much that's been declining. And I just, I find that really fascinating that you're seeing, I expect that in a 50 year old man, right? Uh, but not to see that in, in, in young men in their twenties. And so, and I've been telling them, listen, I'm, I'm not a doctor. I don't know what to tell you in this situation, but I do know that we'll be talking to one on the show about this. And so I know there's a lot of people who have been waiting for this conversation because I know it's helped me out tremendously. And I had no idea how many young men were struggling with this. What's interesting about that is, yeah, the age level has dropped for those that are definite candidates for TRT. Now, you know, you don't necessarily want to go out and check your testosterone levels. That's that's kind of a no-no. I mean, an engineer would do that, but a doctor is counseled against that because you don't want to open up a can of worms that doesn't need to be opened because you don't treat numbers. But most of the time, people don't wake up and say, well, gee, I better check my testosterone yeah. today. They check their testosterone because they have some complaints. Right. So, you know, it, it does kind of tie together that some of these 20-year-olds do have low testosterone and there's a reason why they, you know, they, they have the symptoms of it and there's a reason why they checked, et cetera. What's also interesting about that is, in my experience, it appears that stress is the big driver and it makes sense medically. You know, arguably... Uh, you know, 300 years ago, with life expectancy on average was like 30 years old, life was still different. And that average was driven down by, you know, infant mortality, early death, that sort of thing. But, you know, we're herding sheep for a living. Stress levels are pretty low. You're worried about an occasional wolf. And, yeah. you know, that's, if it does happen, it's, you know, maybe once a month or something like that. And that's what we're designed for, acute stress, not chronic stress. You wake up in today's world, and I'm not whining, but even my dad will say, you know, you know, your dad told you, I'm mm -hmm. sure, same as mine, you know, uh, he went up, uh, he went to and from school, yeah, uphill, uphill, uphill both, both ways, ways in the snow, in the snow <laughs> uh, <laughs> ate dirt and lived in the shoebox, you know, for the first 20 years of his life. Um, he'll say, yeah, you guys have it tougher than we do. And, and none of us here is whining, right? But it is a fact of life. And, and I see it in 20 year olds. I mean, just look at Hollywood, kind of a, maybe a funny side note. I, I got guys that are 20 years old with ED. Yeah. Yeah. It's not because of low testosterone oftentimes it's because they believe what's on that stupid box that says that you're supposed to be able to, and pardon me, this sounds crass, but you're supposed to be able to take care of, you know, like Casanova, five women at one time and do so for five <laughs> yeah. hours. And they're like, oh my God, really? <laughs> that would freak anybody out. Mm -hmm. And so there's some mental stuff going on there that adds stress that can affect your ability to get a, an erection. Yeah. It drives testosterone levels down. And so for in my early part of the career, I would say, well, you know, this is stress driven. You're 28 years old. This doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I do see this low testosterone in a 28 year old. But why don't we think about some ways to lower stress? Well, that some and some people put even more stress on the situation, because what do you do if you've already got 2.3 kids in a mortgage? You're going to go to Bali and become a beach bum, <laughs> you know, to lower your stress levels. The That's not an option. The, the real problem. <laughs> now, the cool thing is that being said, in a 26, 28 year old, um, you have some other options besides TRT. So you can bring that 2.3 kids to a full three uh, by preserving your fertility. In other words, you can you can raise your endogenous production because your testicles are usually still working just fine. It's just your brain, because it's stressed out, mm. is affecting your pituitary, which is right below the brain, sending a signal to the testicles to do their job. So we can give them something called ACG, mm. human chorionogonadotropin, no more abbreviations, yeah. and uh, other things like uh, off-label use of Clomid, or better yet, in Clomiphene, which indirectly gets your uh, pituitary to send a signal to the testicles to make more testosterone. So we have, you know, sort of a, 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 a a bridge gap there that so is uh, that is that what's more common practice then for you if you got a say a 25 or 28 year old young man that came in complained of that before you would say hey let's do you know 200 milligrams of, of testosterone let's first see if we can get this up with hcg or clomid first well that's what i used to do back then and i still do i mean i give them the option because uh it, you know it really gets down to practicalities. Uh, medicine tends to want to let the body do what it wants to do. And again, the biggest uh, argument I have there is, well, that's great, but eventually we die. So, you know, the whole anti-aging movement is, and, and get sick in the meantime too, is to try and improve the quality of life and get the best of what na mother nature gives us and get rid of the worst. So my argument is, look, by the time you're 50, certainly, more than likely, odds are you're going to be on TRT, right? If at 30, you're having issues already, I want you to have the options. Uh, even for some, it's just the mental aspect of, even though we are dependent upon air, food, and sleep, 
uh, and for some of us other things uh, to, to, to live an enjoyable life. Uh, for some reason, having to do testosterone once a week is something you go, wait a minute, I don't want to be dependent on anything. Mm -hmm. And I get that psychologically. But to have a choice is nice, but I'm not going to necessarily counsel a 26-year-old, hey, you have to do it this way. If they've got abnormally low T, I certainly will suggest to them, just because it makes life easier, not just mentally, but if they want to father uh, children, it's easier to maintain fertility than to try and regain it if you lose it, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. Even though I would argue, even that really these days is not a consideration. I mean, it is, but it, you know, I've, I can say this for sure. I've never had anybody lose fertility that didn't regain fertility uh, for for uh, physiological reasons. I've had people for psychological reasons back in the day when we pull you off tea and say, "Well, let's just hope it comes back." That you know, after nine months, I'd forget about it. But these days, even while on TRT, if someone, which doesn't happen that often loses their fertility, they can regain it by just jumping on some uh, HCG. HCG, for example, human chorionic gonadotropin, mm -hmm. to get the testicles to, to, to jump back online and, and uh, you know, get the, the sperm flowing again. Yeah, I, that's great advice because I feel like, you know, a 25-year-old, The I think the fear that I would have if I was in your shoes of just right away prescribing him testosterone is – you know, that may mask uh, all all the other issues that he's got going on. Maybe he has have stress. Maybe he does have a lot of other bad habits that are causing some of that too. And just by simply elevating those for him may make him think that he's better, but he's really not addressing all the root causes. Well, you bring up another issue that I, I, I wouldn't necessarily touch on, but since you bring it up, yeah. With those patients, uh, in, invariably what I'll do is recommend something called a, an MRI of the, the head. Uh, we want to see if the pituitary is damaged, has a tumor on it, is missing an empty cell, we call it, uh, because that can be an issue. Uh, we can also do some other tests because there might be uh, an extra X chromosome, uh, uh, Kleinfelter's disease. So we want to find all the possibilities because, again, at 28, it's unusual. Although, again, for stress reasons, we're seeing it way more often than we used to, even just 20 years ago. But in a 58-year-old, you go, well, okay, mm -hmm. duh. Yeah. And so, you know, you follow what's called a differential diagnosis where, you know, if you see a hoof print, you look for a horse before you look for a zebra. You follow the things that make the most sense. But in a younger patient, you want to rule out some genetics. You want to rule out some um, enzyme issues where they might not be converting. Uh, I want to call it CAH. Um uh, and then, uh, you know, these, these issues with the pituitary. So that, that's part and parcel of evaluating someone who's a younger candidate for sure. Okay. Now that said, what happens if you do have a, uh, it's called a pituitary microadenoma. It sounds scary. Just a fancy way of saying you have a little small tumor on the pituitary, which by the way is rarely, uh, uh malignant. It's just a growth that's messing with your production of luteinizing hormone, right? What if someone says, well, okay, that's great, but I don't want you drilling you know a hole usually through the roof of the mouth and and taking that thing off i don't want i don't want surgery mm -hmm. then you're still back to square one but at least you have a reason and that, i think that's to your point mm -hmm. but also to your point are there things that are typically deadly that come with low t meaning that are that are driving it that you might miss no okay Interesting. so so it's again pretty safe what we deal with well i dr rand we I, this is the first time we've We've wanted to, or actually worked with any uh, hormone replacement therapy facility. There's been lots of people who wanted to work with us, talk with us. We did our homework. We chose working with you because uh, the information you already have out on YouTube, the way you talk about the way you do, we really appreciate it. So it, it's it's great. And we do get tons of questions and DMs mm -hmm. on this. It's like a big thing, especially when Adam talks about Yeah, I'm about tired of stuff. trying to answer them. So. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so you brought a lot of clarity you, for me, Yeah, so too, we appreciate you coming great. on the show, and we appreciate this uh, you know, moving forward because we'd love to have you back on answering specific questions at some point and just talking to our audience because this is definitely a, a big issue, a quality of life issue. Well, I have a lot of fun doing it because, you know, as with anything, it's like, um, I don't know, when you when you buy a new car, then all of a sudden you notice how many people have that same car on the road. Right? Yeah. Uh, not exactly a good analogy, but, you know, I just figured everyone knew this stuff, you know, more or less, you know, and, and then we got to talking about it, like you said, on some of those YouTube videos and you find out how many people go, wow, 
I didn't know that. I didn't realize that. So it really has been a lot of fun. And, and doctors live, I don't care what anybody says, you know, doctors live for this, right? We want the, we want the pat on the back. Hey, thanks doc. I really, really feel a lot better. And so it's been a great source of pleasure for, for, for me and, and everybody who works over on my team. I mean, uh, it's a, like I say, it's a great job I have because you see a lot of happy patients, uh, maybe not on the first day, but 90 days in, you know, they come back and they go, doc, you know, I feel so much better because of this, that, and the other. And we actually do get Christmas cards, you know, every year. Hey, That's thanks. Awesome. You know, I had another great year. So. Well, you gave, you did give a great, great analogy earlier about it being, you know, the stigma around it being very similar like the marijuana industry. I just think there's there's still a lot of people around it that just think that it's, you know, testosterone is this scary hormone that, you know, you're doing drugs if you do it and only these bodybuilders. And, of course, they attach it to the bodybuilders that have died and think that it's because of that or that you're going to beat your wife because you take testosterone. <laughs> I mean, there's just – there's these awful stigmas that have been around for a long time around that are still there so uh no i think there's a lot more education that needs to, to happen around it so I'm, I'm excited to have you come on the show yeah well to that end just to add another tidbit before we we sign off i mean um that that the, you know the wife beater thing the roid rage thing is really like i said earlier i think it has to do with excess estrogen you know making you moody and irascible rather than anything else excess dht can make you edgy but not that kind of roid rage type stuff and, and that goes back to you know yeah, that the problems with like with so many things comes with mismanagement, not doing it the right way. Right. And as long as you keep the estrogen down, it's not going to turn Dr. Jekyll into Mr. Hyde. But what I tell people is, yeah, if you're already an asshole, and I won't name names, well, <laughs> yeah, let's just <laughs> use that. If you're, you're already an asshole, an asshole you're just with, a bigger asshole. Gonna, now. Exactly, <laughs> perfect. I couldn't have said it better. Uh, it's not going to turn you into one. So, so that's the only caveat I would say. For some people, maybe it's good that you let a little air out of their tire, yeah. but they were that, that, that way their whole life. You know? In other words, don't yeah. call uh, Dr. Rand if you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah well, please nice uh, refrain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, thanks again. Thanks for coming on the show. No, my pleasure. Really, my pleasure. Thank you. The fact that eating healthy is more expensive as a myth. This is largely due to people compare processed or fast foods in this category. And so they say, oh, if I eat at that healthy restaurant versus that unhealthy restaurant, boy, is that more expensive. Don't look at processed foods 